Uh, but thank you very much for coming back, and uh, I think it's a good occasion to meet uh, our uh, to hear for the day. And we, we are, I am personally very, very uh, glad to have him here because uh, for the day is a very busy person, and I tell you something about his uh, well work schedule uh, in a few seconds. But um, and therefore, I'm very, very glad to, uh, that you accepted our invitation and uh, that you can make it to one um, for this evening, coming from one conference actually uh, in Bochum, in Bochum yeah? one conference in Bochum to another conference in Bonn. Just a few words um, on him. Uh, Volker Klecht is uh, or studied, uh, well, I don't start with the, he's born in and then and so on. Uh, I start with this, um, uh, well, with some kind of um, more important uh, information. He studied Protestant theology, comparative religion, and sociology and philosophy, philosophy in Heidelberg and Bielefeld, and uh, he got his uh, PhD in 1995 uh, at the Faculty of Sociology, at the, the famous uh, Faculty of um, Sociology in uh, at the Bielefeld University, with the work um, or with the dissertation on Georg Simmel's theory of religion, and uh, well, as it is in the, the German system. Uh, some years later, six years later, to be uh, or specific, six years later, he uh, got his habilitation or he made his habilitation uh, at the same uh, faculty, uh, again at the Bielefeld University, on a uh, very interesting topic on religion in modern society. Uh, yeah, he has worked, or he was lecturer for a long time, I think uh, for uh, 10 years, lecturer for sociology at this, uh, no, not this, at this institute but um, at the University in uh, Heidelberg. Uh, and it was, I think, what are you, uh, would you like to translate Forschungsstätte, the Evangelische Studiengemeinschaft, it's not, not translatable, it's untranslatable. <laughs> you cannot translate it. Some, somewhere in Germany he was lecturer, so for 10 years, and, and then afterwards in 2004, in 2004 he became professor, full professor for comparative religion at the U the Ruhr University in Bochum, where he um, still is uh, working. Um, and he is very busy, I told you um, that before, he is very busy at the moment because he is acting director of two institutions. Uh, he is the director of the international, this is a nice, nice well, expression here, of the International Research Consortium, Research Consortium on um, Dynamics it's a so-called Kete Hamburger colleague in Germany. It's a very, very big, um, well, it's a very big institution funded by the BMBF, um, and it's nicely translated here in International Research Consortium on Dynamics and the History of Religions between Asia and, and Europe. And second, he is um, as well director of the Center for Religious Studies, CLS, at uh, the Bonn University. And I'll tell you something about these institutions, because then afterwards you know that he is very busy. The Gilde Hamburger Kolleg, or this consortium, uh, is um, well, it's a consortium for research in the humanities. Uh, it is funded, as I told you, by the Federal, Federal Ministry of Education and Research. And it uh, has started um, work in April 2008. And uh, within this, this uh, Peter Hamburger Kolleg, this consortium, nearly 50 researchers. So I think it's a kind of institute for advanced studies. Yeah, I think we have to know this. Around 50 researchers from 13 academic, academic disciplines are working on uh, 28 individual projects. Um, and in addition, up to 10 fellowships each year are granted to scholars from all over the world, and they have only one, more or less, more or less, more or less one coordinator, and this is uh, for the question, you can imagine that, uh, well, it's very, uh, you have to work very hard to coordinate such a big, big project. I think it's funded for six years with the, uh, well, the option to get another funding for another six years, and they got this, uh, actually, they got this extension this uh, year in uh, May, no, in May, and we can congratulate him and the colleague, the Hitler Hamburger colleague, for getting this uh, these um, another six years. Um, it's a big colleague. Uh, I would say all these all these researchers investigate the dynamics of formation and spread of religions, uh, the interaction between different religious traditions, as well as that their densification within the complex structures of the so-called major religions in Asia and Europe. 
A special focus lies on the relation, relational constellations in the emergence of the rigid field. Based on this premise, cultural and rigid traditions can be described as a combination of ongoing process of orientation and exchange. So it is put, uh, or so it is written uh, on, the, on the website of the center uh, of the uh, Kid Hamburger colleague. And this Kid Hamburger colleague is just one part, one part of the of an over well, of an, of an, well, of an institutional frame uh, at the University of um, Bochum, and the frame is uh, on the, the so-called, um, how do you call it, the uh, research departments. So the University of Bochum has this excellent, this very excellent Kede Hamburger Kolleg, and the Kede Hamburger Kolleg is part of an overall uh, research structure. Um, and these, this research structure is uh, organized or is funded or implemented, I would say implemented, has been implemented by the um, uh, University of Bochum. Uh, and it's, the idea is uh, cut, cutting, cutting edge, where well, it's cutting edge, cutting edge research at the University of Bochum is organized along the lines of flexible interdisciplinary research departments. And research departments that maintain strong networks between each other and also on an international scale that lead to a larger cluster so as you here for delving into comprehensive issues. Research departments are flexible units forming bridges across disciplinary borders and pool existing excellence in interdisciplinary research. I think it's a good, uh, good idea from the University uh, from the, well, the at the University of uh, Bochum to implement uh, such kind of research, I think, programs. And research, department, now it comes, uh, research departments are set up for a specific period of time and tied to several criteria. First, an overarching research strategy. Second, proven, proven excellence in collaborative research. Third, a strategy for advancing early career researchers. And fourth, a uh, concept for research-oriented research teaching. And this is well, this is funded. This is funded um, by the Ministry of Innovation, Science, and Research and Technology of North Rhine-Westphalia um, with uh, 20, 20 million euros. And of course, you can participate in a well, in a, I would say, in a, com a competition for these uh, research departments. And he is uh, the leading director of one of these well, very, I think, very. Um, very excellent, I think it's not excellent, very, very excellent, no? very, very excellent uh, institutions at this uh, University of uh, Bochum. I think he's only he's the CERNAS, the Center of, um, the center of uh, for Religious Studies, is one out of five, one out of five um, very excellent uh, centers at this university. So now you have, you have an idea why he's so busy, why we are glad to have him here, and that we can proud that he is here. And um, last but not least, I would uh, say that his main research interests um, cover the theory of religion and history of religion, religious, religious pluralization and globalization processes of secularization, religion and violence, religion and so on. What do you I mean? I think religion is more or less everything that is connected with religion. This is, this is something, so we are, he's, he's a perfect person to speak on globalizing religion, I would say. So, I pass to yeah, thank you very much, Stefan Kunemann, for the invitation and well, the kind introduction and the advertisement. And please accept my apologies for not having attended the entire conference. Uh, it's not my um, usual behavior. We had a conference on the Mediterranean history, actually, of religions in Bochum, where I had to be present, and it took me one and a half hour. Uh, to switch from the uh, Mediterranean region to uh, Crossroads Asia. Now, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, uh, I know that I'm competing with the weather and therefore appreciate very much your choice to come back and listen to the lecture. The study of religion and interdisciplinary research on religion have been facing a host of challenges for some time now, among them the following three issues. Firstly, research on religion, whether from a historical or a present-day perspective, has lost sight of its subject due to epistemological considerations as well as post-colonial studies. 
Secondly, deconstructivist insights have made it clear that it is not possible to speak of religious traditions such as Christianity, Islam, or Buddhism, and so on, as single, clearly defined, or even monolithic entities. The difficulty of distinguishing different traditions from each other without essentializing them is one of the uh, is uh, one that research on religion shares with cultural studies in general. Thirdly, there has been reflection on the concept of religion for a long time. However, the question of the history of religions, of its unity within the different processes taking place individu individually at different times, that means the question of what constitutes the religious practice in time and space and what holds it together in its innermost core, this question is condemned to the margin. The subject of uh, um, uh, the study of religion risks being blurred or even disappearing with the mentioned uh, problems. For example, as the dissolution of religion in culture, as some colleagues suggest. Furthermore, with an exaggerated constructivism, it is not possible to fully understand how and why religious traditions, though construed, in practice are nonetheless often perceived as distinct entities. Facing the mentioned challenges, namely to avoid both any essentialism and an exaggerated constructivism, I will start with considerations on analytical concepts, namely on the notions of field and tradition, followed by observations on the emergence of, relig of uh, regional religious fields and generic object linguistic concepts, and finally turn to questions of an emerging global religious field between distinct and blurring boundaries. Since I'm, I am an outsider in the philological and historical subjects I refer to in my paper, please excuse any mistakes, wrong spelling and pronunciation. I will be happy to learn from the respective experts. In order to avoid any essentialism, I suggest to refer to the field concept uh, uh, that is uh, developed by Pierre Bourdieu and to further develop it. Following on from Bourdieu, I do not, do not have a substantial understanding of a religious field. It is not a once and for all times given entity. Rather, it is permanently being constituted, reproduced, and changed by interactions between different elements, such as ideas, agents, notions, institutional settings, experiences, artificial objects, and concepts. Within the field approach, the meaning, function, and impact of a single element cannot be understood in isolation, but only in a broader context of mutual relations and attachments. A field of forces is both more and less than the aggregation of single elements and holds them together. It is not to be understood essentially in the sense of a common ground, but as energy between elements that refer to each other, be it consensual or, as it is mostly the case, contested. Furthermore, it is relevant to distinguish between the inner and the outer boundaries of a religious field. Its inner boundaries are permanently being established and reproduced by inter- and inter-religious controversies surrounding its conceptual and practical content. Its outer boundaries emerge through the distinction and interferences between religion and other societies. And not to forget the interaction between religious practice and its scientific observation, which constitutes a field of its own. This is an old and complex hermeneutical issue, as we all know. In other words, single religious elements, religious traditions, and a religious field have to be studies, studied uh, with a relational approach. That means that each religious entity comes into existence and is to be observed only in relation to other religious entities and to non-religious topics. Another conceptual tool is the notion of tradition. 
against the background of field theory and following on from the approach on tradition of Edward Shields, I regard a religious tradition as an entity that is permanently being established, reproduced and changed by its elements, for example, agents, concepts, institutions, settings, artificial objects and so on. These elements form a semiotic chain by more or less strong interaction, that means by referring to each other in a high frequency. A religious tradition is the result of formation and reform processes and at least from the perspective of a scientific analysis a it is a retrospective uh, construction. Tradition means attributing continuity and is designed to trace back one's own position to sources that are claimed to be authentic. In general, the reason for the formation of a tradition is the size of a religious movement or the encounter with other religious currents, due to which internal and external differences require regulation. Thus, the existence of a tradition is always claimed by certain agents who are opposed by others. Traditions and networks of traditions can be identified and distinguished from each other without regarding them as essential entities or having to follow object linguistic normative differentiations such as between orthodox, heterodox and heretic. Instead, both strong and weak interactions and boundaries can be identified. Thus, it is possible to distinguish less condensed networks of traditions whose elements are only loosely connected from more condensed networks of traditions as this um, figure intends to illustrate. Secondly, I would like uh, um, um, to speak about the rise of regional religious fields now and I would like to give three examples of the heuristic potential when using the concepts of field and tradition within the history of religions, namely the emergence of the Mediterranean, the South Asian and the East Asian religious field. I would uh, firstly like to refer to the rise of early Christianity with regard to its connection with Judaism as part of uh, the emergence of a Mediterranean religious field and its interferences with politics as an example for the constitution of a religious tradition as a field of interacting elements with inner and outer boundaries. In late uh, antiquity, Islam also comes into play, but for uh, reasons of uh, the lack of competence and, 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 and uh, uh, time, I won't be able to go into detail with that. And for reasons of modeling, I distinguish between political, cultural and religious processes as three dimensions. And please accept my apologies for oversimplifying a very complex historical process. However, although I'm an outsider in this respect, I think that there is at least some empirical evidence for uh, uh, these distinctions and uh, for my, my um, suggested uh, way of modeling. I would like to uh, mention Roman, the Roman Empire, uprisings in Palestine, imperial and emperor cult, as well as the Roman practice of crucifixion as elements of firstly politics. The latter three elements uh, uh, enter the other field of forces called early Christianity and are transformed into religious entities. The kingdom of God is understood as distinguished from politics and crucifixion becomes a religious sign of salvation. But how did, this, uh, how did this happen? The process can be understood if we consider the attachment of the mentioned elements to other entities, which at the same time constitute the field called Roman Christianity. For example, common meal uh, communities turn via mystery cards into the Christian concept of Eucharist, which is being attached to the concept of crucifixion. And this process is again accompanied by a transformation of other actors, for instance, 
from the philosophical concept of logos via the motive of the theos anea and concepts such as resurrection and messianism to Christological concepts. In addition, we have to consider the formation of early Judaism as part of the emerging religious field when describing the rise of early Christianity. Judaism also constitutes through the interaction between different elements, such as Melchat as the Jewish version of the Kingdom of God, Pesach, the concepts of Exodus and Covenant, the Torah, and so on. But they also interact with politics and with elements in the Christian field. These mechanisms are the take-off for the development of a Mediterranean religious field to which, uh, as I have said, Islam later enters. I secondly would like to refer to the rise of early Buddhism with regard to its connection with Vedic Brahmanic religion as part of the emergence of a South Asian religious field and its interferences with politics as another example for the constitution of a religious tradition as a field of interacting elements with inner and outer boundaries. Of course, Jainism and local religions also come into play. I would like to mention Dharma, Sasana and Sangha as elements that are initially placed in the field of politics and then enter the religious sphere. The process can be understood if we again consider the attachment of the, of the mentioned elements to other entities which at the same time constitute the field called early Buddhism. Ancient India initially represents an undifferentiated condition of moral customs, divine and human law. During the Middle and Late Vedic period, that is around 18, 800 to 400 BCE, Dharma referred to social order and the laws of society that the king was ob obligated to enforce. Dharma thus becomes an abstract concept and entity, a cosmic force that stands above the king. It is called the power behind the royal power. This hypostatization of Dharma is carried on when Dharma and Adharma are considered uh, um, deities or cosmic categories. Dharma means the divine principle that gave legitimacy um, and a meaning to a worldly ruler. Since religion, law and customs are not clearly differentiated in the elder notion of Dharma, we shouldn't speak of religious but of secularized customs, ethics and law in ancient India. Within Buddha's teaching and early Buddhism, the term Dharma has been transformed into a clear religious concept of salvation in distinction to what we rule and customs. Dharma changed from being a peripheral concept to becoming a central and the theological key concept defining the Buddhist religion. Dharma becomes increasingly ethicized within the primarily ethical religion of Buddhism. It came to define the good and the righteous life uh, and the truth the Buddha discovered which made such a religious conduct of life possible. A religious field uh, distinguished from the political field emerges through reinterpret reinterpreting political concepts as religious ones. For instance, sasana, initially a notion to denote royal instructions, is used by Buddhism for the teaching of Buddha and Sangha, initially understood as the organization of a feudal republic, becomes a religious notion to denote the Buddhist community, like it is the case with um, Ecclesia and Christianity. The concepts of Dharma, Sasana and Sangha have been attached to each, uh, to each other, and thus mutually stress their religious meaning in distinction, not in separation, but in distinction to their political use. The Vedic Brahmanic religion constituted itself, at least to a certain extent, as a reaction to the formation of Buddhism. 
The Vedic Brahmanic religion enters the religious field by competing with Buddhism on questions of salvation and thus also begins to distinguish itself from politics. The same holds true for Jainism and Islam also enters uh, the Indian uh, religious field later on, namely during the Mughal period. East Asia is another example for the formation of a regional religious field. When Buddhism has been brought to East Asia, the so-called sinicization of Buddhism, there has not been a religious field distinguished from the political field. The Chinese term Fa has then been used to translate the Sanskrit term Dharma. Fa originally had a clear political and legal meaning, namely penalty executed by the state. Fa has been attached with other terms such as Sangha as the Chinese term for the Buddhist community and thus the religious meaning of those terms have mutually been expressed. Taoism has formed itself as a religious tradition parallel to and in interaction with the civilization of Buddhism. Tao has a very complex history that, however, might be summarized as follows. Uh, the term originally is bound to the idea of motion. During the first millennium BCE, the term could refer to the motion of river waters in artificial channels. Here one can observe the hidden political dimension of the term. The Chinese culture developed along the Yellow River, and one of the duties of the ruler was to control the usually quite unquiet uh, waters of the river. Hence, the mythic sovereign Yu and the control of the floods uh, through dikes and uh, dams is one of the founding myths of China. Tao undoubtedly becomes a main religious notion in the first centuries of the Common Era. In many cases, it is constructed as distinct from politics. Many Taoist texts attack the ritual system of the court that sacrificed animals in the ceremonies. Even in the earliest texts, uh, one has uh, the community of um, um, uh, the Tao that must convert the ruler. Other terms such as Fu uh, means talisman and uh, Lu it means uh, register uh, uh, have been attached to the notion of Tao and those terms again mutually stress their uh, religious meaning. Fu um, originally referred to matching uh, um, tallies, tokens that symbolize military authority. Many kinds of fu were used in the political and economic field as a kind of contract. The term lu um, etymologically refers to the schematic lists of data, for example, genealogies or bibli um, 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 uh, bibliographies uh, were called lu. The term is close or came to be associated to population registers. Far beyond doubt, in the 3rd century BCE, the possession of these documents became a symbol of political power. At a certain point in time, um, this idea entered the religious realm. We find uh, excavated manuscripts dating back to the last centuries BC. Um, um, with deities of the other world deciding about the death uh, of an individual by taking his or her name away from the list. In the second century uh, of the Common Era, there already um, um, are a, a list of names of immortals um, uh, um, existed, usually proto Taoists. Medieval Taoists uh, then had lists of names of gods and the possession of these lists allowed the adept to control the, the gods mentioned in the list. Thus, the two religious traditions of uh, Buddhism and Taoism were parts of the formation of an East Asian religious field. However, however the boundaries between them uh, are not always uh, clear. For example, in the second century um, CE, the Han Emperor is said to have worshipped both Laozi and Buddha. 
However, during the following centuries, the influence of uh, Buddhism and on Taoism was overwhelming, and we can observe strong interaction between Confucianism, Buddhism, and Taoism. The three examples do not claim full empirical evidence, since, as I said, I'm an outsider um, in, in, in these respects, and the examples are uh, much too rough. The entities mentioned are to be added by many others and consist themselves of many other uh, elements. Thus, the entities should be analyzed as punctualizations, hubs and nodes, in the sense of approaches on social and semantic networks. The example should only demonstrate the heuristic potential of the field model for empirical work. My third um, paragraph is on the formation of regional religious concepts. With intensified uh, diachronic and synchronic encounter, object linguistic concepts arise. When analyzing the conceptual impacts of con contact, it is important to consider the following. Firstly, we should include family resemblances in the sense of Ludwig Wittgenstein to get a broader spectrum of meaning. For example, the term religio that develops in the Latin world includes a semantic overlapping with other notions such as lex, ritus and fides. The relation between Dhamma and Sasana might serve as an example for the Pali context and the relation between Deen and Imam for the Arabic context. Secondly, we cannot isolate the meaning of single terms but have to analyze them in relation to other contrasting notions. For example, we are only able to cover the meaning of the Latin word term religio if we look at, at its relation to opposed terms, for instance to superstitio on the one hand and scientia on the other. When analyzing, uh, um, when analyzing interactions between concepts and the respective practice that they cover, we are able to identify regional um, um, uh, uh, concepts um, which form, as I already said, uh, fields such as the Mediterranean, the South and Central Asian and the East Asian field, like I am trying to exemplify in the, in the second part of my talk. However, none of the fields, like any field, are isolated but interact with others. The Indian and Chinese rights controversies in, in early modern times are only most prominent examples of such encounters with impacts on object linguistic concepts and practices. Of course, differences occur within these interactions. For example, while Lex stresses the ethical and legal dimension, Jiao and later San Jiao accentuate the dimension of teaching. But despite of these differences, all of the mentioned terms are in a mutual dependency because they are related to each other by, for example, translation, contrasting, homogenization, and other ways of comparison. So comparison is not restricted uh, to us as academics, but uh, is part of the uh, empirical process um, as such. The emergence of generic concepts in the history of religions is most relevant to academic research. With regard to the relationship between empirical object and scientific meta-language, I suggest the uh, following hypotheses. Firstly, meta-language can best correspond with religious historical material and avoid a serial scientism when it links in with the reflection in which an object linguistic awareness of the, of the religious arises and is actively promoted. Secondly, the inner religious reflection is always fostered when a. handed down traditions become thematic and thus compiled, reformed or rejected, this is diachronically uh, stimulated religious reflection, and b. when religious traditions come into contact with others, and this is uh, synchronically stimulated religious reflection. 
the interaction frequency between different religious traditions and respective concepts gets enhanced in early modern and modern times and exceeds regional religious fields, mainly forced by colonialism, mission activities, and processes of globalization. And this is the time when a global religious field might start to emerge, uh, when, when the increase of the quantity of interaction leads to a qualitative change. The impact of colonialism, nation-state building, transnationalization and globalization on the history of religions is of course a huge topic. Much research already has been conducted in this respect. One of the most important results uh, consists of the fact that the Western notion of religion has not simply been exported to other regions, but similar concepts in the sense of family resemblances already existed in other parts of the world, and interactions between different concepts have covered and still cover repercussions on Western notions of religion. This is an indi indicator uh, for the emergence of a global religious field starting in early modern times. In the following third part, I will, however, restrict myself to some observations on recent developments. Uh, so I skip the last uh, 500 years. <clears throat> As I said in the beginning, it is important to consider the distinction between inner and outer boundaries when following a field, a field approach. I will start with observations on the inner boundaries of a global religious field that enables its self-referentiality. The term religion, respectively the attribute religious and its translation into other languages, seem to be accepted in many parts among the world population. I take the findings of the World Values Survey as an indicator for this. The survey has been conducted in five ways between 1981 and 2008 and includes 80 countries and almost um, 260,000 respondents. More than 99% of the respondents gave an answer to the question whether they consider themselves either as a religious person, not as a religious person, or as a convinced atheist. On this slide you can see the dis distribution. Between 1981 and 2004, the, the amount of respondents who consider themselves as a religious person inclines, and the sum of those who do not consider themselves as a religious person declines accordingly. The amount of convinced atheists is more or less constant around 5%. These findings might serve as an indicator for the fact that the global religious field has become larger regarding the inclusion of individuals. This, among other reasons, might be caused by the decline of political ideologies after 1989 and religion is becoming an identity marker that seems to overlay other identity factors such as culture, ethnicity and political attitudes. Not only do more people consider themselves as a religious person, but also the importance of religion as you can see on the x-axis of this diagram, and the comfort and strength people get from their religion has risen, as you can see on the y-axis. Um, thus, the global religious field does not only get larger, but also stronger. Oops. However, there are denominational differences. According to the fourth wave of the World Values Survey, conducted between 1999 and 2004, religion is much more important in life and has a deeper impact for Muslim and evangelical respondents than for Buddhists and members of Orthodox churches or those who do not adhere to any denomination. Roman Catholics, Hindus and Protestants are situated near the average. Do 
Next to denominational differences, or perhaps even beyond them, the global, the, the global religious field may begin to be structured by the distinction between religion and spirituality. This, at least, has been assumed by scholars such as Paul Healers and Linda Woolhead. Their definition of spirituality in difference to religion is inspired by Charles Taylor, who postulates a massive subjective turn of modern culture, a turning away from, I quote, life as, that means, for example, life lived as a dutiful wife, father, husband, strong leader, self and man, uh, etc., to subjective life, that means, life lived in deep connection with the unique experiences of myself in, of myself in relation." End of quote. According to Healers and Woodhead, the language of life as and subjective life enables us to redefine the relation between religion and spirituality, uh, but namely by differentiating between life as religion and subjective life spirituality. However, is there an object linguistic evidence for this academic distinction? The Bertelsmann Religion Monitor that has been conducted in 2008 in 21 countries includes questions both on religiosity and spirituality. First of all, the findings show more or less the same pattern as the World Value Survey data. Significantly more Pentecostals, Evangelicals and Muslims, with the exceptions of uh, Sunnis and um, 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 Alevites, consider themselves as very religious than Buddhist members, members of Orthodox churches and respondents without any adherence, while Roman Catholics, Protestants, Jews and Hindus are situated near the average. Secondly, and this is my point, Religiosity quite strongly correlates with spirituality. Most of the respondents who are religious combine, at least to a certain degree, religiosity with spirituality and vice versa. Only about 10% make a clear alternative distinction between the two terms. So maybe the scholarly claim transformation from religion to spirituality might happen, at least it doesn't seem to have that much of an object linguistic evidence, that maybe this kind of differentiation is not as important as uh, we usually um, assume, but uh, maybe work at the outer boundaries of the global religious field um, uh, may be of more importance. That uh, is the relation between religion on the one hand and other societal fields on the other. And uh, I turn to this topic in the final part of my talk. Now some bubbles. First of all, it is important to consider that although the global religious field emerges by differentiating itself from other societal fields, it interacts with them. Distinction does not mean separation or even isolation. Maybe this is a reason for misunderstandings in the criticism of theories of societal differentiation. Secondly, societal differentiation is not a unilinear process with a point of no return. It starts in ancient times, as I'm trying to indicate, is still continuing and is not irreversible. Looking at the global scale, we are witnessing blurring boundaries between religion and other societal fields. But this does not necessarily mean that religion is dissolving. Religion proceeds as a distinct field and intersects with other fields at the same time, as, as uh, this figure uh, intends to show. Due to reasons of time, I will restrict myself to some very rough examples and hints. Religion does not merge with the entire cultural sphere, otherwise culture as such would be religious, but interferes with it. 
what is known as the religious dimension in processes of um, cultural defense and identity politics is an example for this intersection and I depicted um, um, uh, identity politics with uh, um, two ways of uh, mapping uh, either, either India or uh, the United States by uh, referring to uh, religious uh, symbols. The intersection between religion and politics in the shape of political religion is of course a big issue. Election campaigns in the USA, as the entire American political history, is a prominent example of this. However, the interference between religion and politics can only happen if both fields proceed distinguished from each other. A political party convention might have to do something with religion, but it is not the same as a religious service. We are also observing an intersection between religion and law. For instance, the headscarf, circumcision and the cross in the classroom are polysemic and polyvalent. They might be both a religious and a legal issue. Furthermore, religion intersects with medicine, not only in pre-modern but also in contemporary times. Due to the limits of academic medicine, alternative practices with religious elements nowadays enhance to a certain extent. However, the blurring boundaries do not necessarily lead to the entire merging of the two fields. Otherwise, we couldn't understand the normal academic technical developments in medicine. Last but not least, Religion interferes with the arts in the shape of art religion. I have placed only three examples out of many on this uh, slide, I'm only taken from, from the uh, uh, West, Western European um, um, cultural history, ranging from Caspar David Friedrich via Franz Bacon to Madonna. It, however, makes a difference if religion refers to art within the religious field or if uh, religious elements are used within the field of arts, or if religion and arts merge in the, in the shape of art religion. In short, observing blurring boundaries between religion and other societal fields does not necessarily mean that religion is dissolving. Intersection needs differentiation as a basis, not only logically, but also empirically. As I said earlier, the process of differentiation is permanently being consolidated as well as changed through interactions between different societal fields. In order to consider both processes of differentiation and interfering, I suggest distinguishing between recursive or self-referential religion on the one hand and processes of secularization on the other. Both start at an undifferentiated level. Following on from Georg Zimmer, a certain kind of, society of um, um, social relations constitutes a disposition from which religion can evolve as a field of its own. They are, as Zimmer calls them, semi-finished religious products in German, religiöse Halbprodukte, or religion-like in German, religio each. Sacralization is the other direction that religion-like social relations can take. Whatever is being sacralized has already been defined by another rationality, for instance, by political rule or the economic desire to sell and own possessions which, however, is not sufficient or felt to be adequate. Therefore, the politically, economically, or however else it may happen to be defined issue, is additionally enriched with an aura of the unavailable and the inescapable by using religious elements. In recursive, self-referential religion, by contrast, non-religious non matters may be negotiated but not in order to additionally enrich them, 
but to fill them completely with religious meaning. A political or economic rationality is converted into a religious one in this case. I suggest that sacralization is uh, thus the blurred boundary and interface between religion and other societal fields. I suggest taking the distinction between recursive religion uh, on the one hand and process of sacralization into account historically and interculturally. This conceptual difference has uh, the advantage of considering the distinct and the blurred boundaries equally and enables us to analyze um, um, uh, religion before religion, next to religion and beyond and beyond religion. Thank you for your attention. So, yeah, um, because this is a keynote uh, lecture, there is no time for discussion, as you know, uh, but maybe we can ask him personally about um, some uh, thought-provoking uh, things he said during his talk. I think it was a very, it wasn't top on macro level, so I think it leaves us with uh, many questions and unanswered questions um, for uh, our way home. Um, so maybe well, now that we have time to digest everything he said and think about uh, these um, concepts. And yeah, I would like to thank him again for, for his talk and I would like to thank everybody else here for coming um, and for joining us for this conference. I would like to uh, thank the, the speakers and the chairs and the audience and especially for everybody who worked behind the scenes to make this uh, event. Uh,